Welcome to Henry Ford Hospital, home of the Henry Ford Transplant Institute. Behind these walls are the results of more than 100 years of innovation and leadership in the world of medicine, along with today's most advanced procedures and technology delivered by a world-class care team. This video presentation has been carefully designed to calm your fears, give you real facts about the road ahead, and provide you with some of the tools that you'll need to start your journey toward a successful transplant. Learning that you need a lung transplant has no doubt created some concerns for you, your family, and your friends. You might be thinking about the transplant surgery or what life will be like before and after the transplant is done. These concerns about major surgery are normal and justified. By working closely with your transplant team, learning the facts and being prepared, you'll begin to feel more comfortable and confident about this procedure and your life afterward. To understand why you need a lung transplant, it helps to know how it works, where the lung is located, and what it does for your body. When you're talking with your care team, you might hear the prefix pulmo, which means lung in Latin. A pulmonologist is a physician who specializes in the treatment of lung conditions and diseases. Lungs are critical, as they make it possible for oxygen to enter your blood and unhealthy carbon dioxide to be removed from your body. On average, a healthy person over the course of a day will breathe in about 2,378 gallons of air. Healthy lungs are a pinkish gray color with a soft, spongy texture. They are located inside your rib cage on either side of your heart. Each set of lungs is made up of lobes or sections, two on the left side and three on the right. The lung on the left is a bit smaller to leave room for your heart. When you breathe in, air travels down your throat through your windpipe, also known as the trachea, and into two large tubes. These tubes are called bronchi and one goes into each one of your lungs. The bronchi tubes then branch off into smaller tubes, like branches on a tree. These smaller tubes continue to form smaller and smaller branches until they are about the thickness of a hair. These are called bronchioles. At the end of the bronchioles, there are smaller air sacs that resemble clusters of grapes. These are called alveoli, which comes from the Latin word meaning little cavity. Each person has about 600 million of these air sacs that expand and contract during breathing. This is where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide gases takes place. When your lungs become severely damaged, it affects the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide your lungs can exchange each time you breathe. Lung disease is usually divided into two categories, obstructive and restrictive. Obstructive lung disease causes a narrowing or blockage of the airways in the respiratory system, making it hard for air to move. Illnesses related to obstructive disease are emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, commonly known as COPD. Restrictive lung disease causes the lung to lose its elasticity or stretchiness. Remember, if a lung cannot expand and contract well, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide may be severely restricted. Illnesses related to restrictive disease are pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, and lung cancer. In both types of diseases, transplantation may be necessary if the damage to the lung is so severe that it can't be repaired. During lung transplantation, surgeons may replace one or both lungs. If a single lung is replaced, it will still be enough to provide you with all the healthy tissue you will need. Typically, lung transplant candidates are between the ages of 16 and 70, do not have any other acute or critical illness, are cancer-free for at least five years, do not have any other significant organ dysfunction like severe heart, kidney, or liver disease, they've abstained from cigarette smoking, alcohol, and drugs for at least six months, and they don't have any significant or active psychiatric problems. Transplant candidates must also be willing to adhere to a strict medical program and consent to physical rehabilitation both before and after transplantation. All candidates and their caregivers must be able to work closely with the entire transplant team. Before being accepted as a transplant recipient, 
you will be required to undergo physical exams, medical tests, and evaluations to determine if any medical conditions exist that might prevent you from benefiting from a lung transplant. A family meeting with members of your transplant team will provide you with important information regarding the procedure, how you will be listed for transplant, and your responsibilities before and after. This meeting is intended to make you and your family more informed about and comfortable with the lung transplant process. It's also an opportunity for you and your family to ask questions regarding the process and request additional information. The transplant process can take a long time and feel overwhelming. Your transplant coordinator will help guide you and your family through the entire process. They will be your primary contact and advocate they are there to answer your questions and offer support. The exams and tests required will be conducted by various medical team members. Physical exams and a complete health history will be conducted by a pulmonologist and a transplant surgeon to evaluate the risks and benefits of receiving a lung transplant. Evaluation of the amount of blood flow through your coronary arteries and into your heart requires a heart catheterization. Blockages within the coronary artery may delay or exclude a candidate from transplantation or necessitate a bypass surgery to be performed at the same time as the transplant. Radiological exams will include a CAT scan and a chest x-ray to check the condition of your lungs. A nuclear medicine lung scan will also be performed to determine if there are any life-threatening blood clots in your lungs and to help determine if you need one or two lungs transplanted. To help diagnose the severity and type of lung disease you have, these tests will be performed. A pulmonary function or breathing test is used to analyze your total lung capacity. A six minute walk assesses the capacity of your lungs to support you during activity. Sputum culture detects and identifies any infections in the lungs or breathing passages. And arterial blood gas testing measures the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your blood to determine how well your lungs are working. In addition, other factors in your blood will be tested to determine the extent of your lung disease, your blood and tissue types for matching, your kidney function, and testing for the presence of specific viruses, including HIV and hepatitis. Other required clinical assessments include a mammogram for women, a colonoscopy, and a bone density test to evaluate your bone strength. You will be required to provide urine specimens at each clinic visit to test for alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and other substances for transplant and insurance purposes. Even before you're listed for transplant, you'll see a number of additional specialists. Your dietitian will help you maintain a healthy diet before and after transplant surgery. Your financial counselor will review your insurance coverage and help you identify costs of procedures and medications associated with your transplant. You'll meet with your transplant psychologist to evaluate your ability to cope with stress during the transplant process and after. Because the process can be long and difficult, you'll meet with your social worker to assess your support system, your ability to follow a treatment plan, and your financial resources and you may be required to complete a dental exam to rule out oral cancer and possible sources of infection. When you've finished all testing and concluded any prescribed treatment, the pulmonologist will review all the information with you. Your results will also be summarized for the transplant committee. They will then review your information as a team to determine whether you are medically fit to undergo the lung transplant surgery. As a member of UNOS, the Henry Ford Transplant Institute must follow strict guidelines that are required for all transplant centers and candidates in the United States. UNOS divides the United States into regions. Each region has one or more organizations that assist in the process of organ procurement and recovery. The state of Michigan's organization is Gift of Life Michigan. Although all transplant centers must follow the same rules and regulations, some candidates prefer to register at more than one transplant center. If you're planning to list at multiple centers, you must notify the transplant team of your plans. Each center will determine who it accepts as a candidate and reserves the right to decline patients who are listed at other centers. Today, there are many more people waiting for lung transplants than there are lungs available. 
to effectively distribute the limited number of available donor lungs and reduce the number of deaths among people waiting for a transplant, each candidate is assigned a Lung Allocation Score, or LAS. Your LAS is derived from exams, tests, and evaluations that are calculated down to a single number between 0 and 100. This number helps predict a candidate's life expectancy while waiting for a lung transplant, as well as survival after a lung transplant takes place. UNOS uses the LAS as a basic priority for distributing donated lungs throughout the United States. Although there's no specific allocation score that will guarantee you a donor lung, candidates with the higher numbers are generally given precedence and placed closer to the top of the donor list, allowing for a shorter wait time. However, a candidate's blood type, body size, and the absence or presence of certain immune system factors in their blood can also influence wait time. It's important to understand that once you receive your LAS number, there is no way to tell when a donor lung will become available. Your transplant coordinator cannot give you an estimate of how long you may have to wait for a transplant. Once you are accepted as a candidate for transplant and have an LAS number, your name will be added to the UNOS Nationally Computerized Database Waiting List. UNOS placement specialists operate the network 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is to ensure that each candidate receives a healthy standard criteria donor lung, or SCD, as soon as it becomes available. An SCD lung is from a donor who has been declared brain dead, but their heart still functions. After being placed on the UNOS list, it is very important to keep your scheduled blood tests and evaluations current and not to miss any of your clinical appointments. Failure to do so could result in removal from the UNOS waitlist and your inability to receive a donor lung when one becomes available. It is also critical that you advise us immediately of any changes in your phone number, address, or insurance coverage. Since time can be a serious factor in receiving a lung, you will need to be available by phone at all times. This enables your coordinator to reach you quickly when an organ becomes available. It is equally important for you to inform your transplant coordinator if you'll be going out of town or out of the country. You must also advise the Henry Ford Transplant Institute if you are hospitalized for any reason, as even small medical changes may alter your status on the waiting list. And remember, do not make any medication changes before or after transplant without consulting your transplant coordinator or physician. When an organ becomes available, medical information is entered into the UNOS computer system and a list of potential recipients is generated. The transplant centers whose patients appear on the ranked list are contacted. The Henry Ford LifeShare team is on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to accept donor calls from UNOS. After receiving and reviewing the organ data from UNOS, a LifeShare team member will contact your transplant doctor. They will then review and consider the donor organ based upon your medical condition, your availability for transplant, the medical criteria of the donor organ, and the distance between Henry Ford Hospital and the organ being offered. According to UNOS policy, the transplant team has only one hour to make its decision to accept or reject an organ offer. This is Henry Ford Hospital's living wall. It's a bright open space where visitors and guests, along with hospital staff, can relax with a cup of coffee, enjoy a snack, or just take in the scenery 365 days a year. Consider this an invitation to visit this space when you come see us. In most cases, donated organs will originate from persons who fit standard criteria. Usually, they are 55 years of age or younger, have not smoked more than one pack per day, have been on a ventilator for no more than five days, and are not known to have used inhaled drugs like cocaine or marijuana. However, there is a serious shortage of lung SCDs, or standard criteria donors. To increase the number of lungs available, we might consider including donors who do not meet these general criteria, or who have experienced cardiac death. Experience has shown that using these organs selectively has resulted in similar outcomes to standard criteria donor organs. Your doctor will explain this situation if and when it arises. In most cases, organs are recovered from a donor whose heart has continued to beat even though their brain has experienced irreversible damage. 
Another optional organ source is the DCD donor. DCD, or donation after cardiac death, means that the donor's heart has irreversibly stopped beating prior to organ donation. In all cases, the transplant surgeon will carefully review the quality of the organ and the donor's history prior to implantation. Organs of insufficient quality are never knowingly used. The decision to accept any organ offered to you is always yours to make. However, it must be balanced with other important factors, including the number of organs available, your specific needs, the risk of your dying, or the possibility you will become too sick for transplantation while waiting for a standard donor lung. If the need to consider a lung with increased risk factors is appropriate for you, the transplant surgeon will give you information and the most up-to-date success rates available to help guide you in your decision. Your decision will in no way affect your status on the UNOS wait list. The waiting period can seem endless and be very stressful. However, there are several things you can do to pass the time constructively and stay focused on your transplant. First, be sure to take good care of yourself. Eat right, take your prescribed medicines, and follow a daily exercise program. It's also critical to stay in contact with your transplant team and notify them if your medical condition changes. If you begin to feel depressed or uneasy, do not hesitate to share your feelings with your team members. They are here to answer your questions, calm your fears, and help you cope. Your social worker, psychologist, and or clergy are good listeners. Talk to them. The most important thing you can do for yourself is to stay involved. Don't put everything on hold while you wait for your transplant. Continue your work, studies, and leisure activities to the best of your ability. Enjoy your hobbies to the fullest or pursue new interests that will help distract you and help you relax. Stay focused on the ultimate goal, a successful transplant. Spend this time with family and friends. It will help take your mind off waiting and enrich your life. Your doctor will give you guidelines on the kinds of physical activities that are right for you. However, don't be afraid to ask about other activities that you might like to try. If you have to travel during the waiting period, you must contact your transplant coordinator and provide detailed travel information, including a phone number, well before you leave. Finally, remember to always be prepared. Keep an updated list with you at all times of your current medications, drug allergies, and health insurance information. This is especially important when visiting the clinic or any member of your transplant team. The day has finally come. It's the call you've been waiting for. A lung is available. Carefully listen to these instructions. It is critical that you tell the coordinator at this time if you have a fever or if you've been recently ill. Be sure to follow all directions as stated. Also, remember not to eat or drink anything once you get that call. You may be instructed to wait for a second confirmation call before leaving for the hospital because the donor lung is undergoing additional testing to determine if it's appropriate for you. If there are any concerns regarding the lung's function or disease, the surgery may be canceled. After you receive the call to come to Henry Ford Hospital, leave as soon as possible and drive carefully. Since you're being called ahead of time, there's no need to take risks while coming to the hospital. When you arrive at the hospital, you'll undergo a series of tests, including blood work, a chest x-ray, and an EKG. Sometimes a surgery is canceled due to the presence of infection or other medical problems you may have developed. Do not let this possible delay in surgery prevent you from being honest with your transplant team. Failure to divulge issues about your health could dramatically affect the outcome of your transplant surgery or seriously threaten your life. Once your transplant is given the green light, you will be prepared for surgery. A family member can stay in the room with you for most of this time. An IV line will be inserted, followed by reviews of your medical history and a series of physical exams. There are inherent risks in all surgeries, especially surgeries conducted under general anesthesia. A physician will explain the surgical process you're about to undergo. Once the physician is sure you understand everything that was discussed, you will be asked to sign a consent form for the surgery. You'll be given a sedative to help you relax and feel sleepy. 
Additional lines and tubes that you'll need for the operation will be inserted. These lines usually include a second IV line with three separate lines that's inserted into your neck to allow for uninterrupted testing and the administration of various medications and fluids. A catheter, similar to an IV, provides an uninterrupted testing of oxygen levels, blood pressure, and heart rate. A gastric tube to keep your stomach empty and prevent nausea and vomiting. A small tube which draws urine from your bladder and a ventilator tube that's inserted down your throat to help you receive oxygen and breathe more comfortably during and after the surgery. Some of these tubes can be uncomfortable, but fortunately, they are only temporary. When the ventilator tube is in, you will not be able to talk. You will be given paper and pencil to communicate with your nurses and doctors. After surgery, when it's determined that you can breathe comfortably on your own, the tube will be removed and you'll be able to speak again. The surgery will take approximately four to eight hours, depending on if it's a single or double transplant. For a single lung transplant, an incision is made on the left or right side of the back. A double or bilateral transplant requires a single clamshell incision across the chest. The operation begins before the donor lung arrives in the operating room. This is to limit the amount of time the organs are without blood supply. Your lung is removed and the donor lung is placed in your chest cavity. You might need to be placed on the heart and lung machine during the operation to relieve your body of the need to support life by use of the diseased lungs. To implant your new lung, the surgeon connects the major blood vessels and main airway of the donor lung to your circulatory system and airway. The same connections are made for the other lung if you're having a double lung transplant. Drainage tubes inserted at the end of the operation will remain in place for a few days. They will drain trapped air, fluid, and residual blood out of the chest and therefore allow your new lungs to fully re-expand. Although uncomfortable, all of the tubes will be taken out as soon as they are no longer needed. Immediately after surgery, you will be taken to the intensive care unit, referred to as SICU, where you will remain for several days. During that time, you will be slightly restrained to avoid accidentally dislodging any tubes or drains as you wake up. Depending on your recovery, you may remain on a ventilator from one to several days. During this time, blood transfusions and temporary medications will also be used as needed to aid your healing process. As you gain strength, the special lines are removed and you are once again able to move about and do more for yourself. Most patients are moved to the general floor for post-transplant patients within a week. Others will have a more prolonged need for services found only in the SICU. The average length of hospital stay will range from two to four weeks. Because lung transplantation entails very complicated surgical and medical procedures, occasionally your discharge from the hospital may be postponed. This could be caused by your new lungs not functioning properly, your stomach or bowels not functioning normally after surgery, a delay in stabilizing your medications, or an infection. Such a delay may increase the length of your hospital stay. Don't worry, your team will be with you every step of the way. Once released from the hospital, many patients transfer to an inpatient rehabilitation center where directed strengthening can help them regain their independence and mobility safely. Your transplant was a success. Because proper home care is critical to that success, you and your caregiver will be given detailed information and training before you leave the hospital. This important information will include warning signs that should prompt you to immediately contact your coordinator, wound care and infection control, diet and activity, and most importantly, the proper use of your medications. You will also be given contact information so you can reach your transplant coordinator 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Remember, if you're ever in doubt, call your coordinator. To prevent your body's immune system from rejecting your new lung, you will receive immunosuppressant medications immediately after the surgery. You will need to stay on them for the rest of your life. 
This is necessary because your body can't tell the difference between beneficial foreign tissues, like your new lung, and dangerous ones, like an invading organism. Immune suppressant medications reduce the effectiveness of cells that normally attack and destroy disease-causing organisms and foreign tissue. Some of the immunosuppressant drugs currently in use are Prograf, Prednisone, Celsept, Imuron, Cyclosporin, and Rapamune. Your physician will determine which drug or combinations of drugs are right for you. It is critical that you take your medications on a strict schedule, exactly as prescribed by your physician. Immune suppression medications are taken at the standard times of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Do not skip a dose or change in any way the prescribed amount of medicine you are to take unless instructed to do so by your physician or coordinator. If you realize you've missed a dose, you must call your coordinator immediately. Do not decide what to do on your own. It's also very important for you to remember, never take any medication, supplement, or herbal remedy, whether prescribed by another physician or purchased over the counter without contacting your transplant team first. Carefully following these instructions is vital to achieving and maintaining a long-term quality of life. Some of the side effects that can occur are tremors, especially in the hands, headaches, elevation of blood pressure, weight gain, diabetes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and thin, fragile skin. If you experience any of these side effects, tell your coordinator immediately. Some side effects are relieved or significantly reduced with just a minor change in the dose, but only your transplant physician can make that right change. Medication doses are based on blood tests, which measure the level of drugs in your bloodstream. Again, never change your dose or stop taking your medicine on your own. Another side effect from the immunosuppressant drugs is your inability to fight off infection and disease. This is especially true during the first three months after your transplant, as your medications will be at their highest levels during this time. You must take precautions to prevent infection. One of the simplest and most effective ways is hand washing. Washing your hands frequently is the most overlooked yet simplest form of infection control. Have soap at every sink. Ordinary soap and a pump dispenser is fine. You and your caregiver should be especially careful to always wash your hands before handling medications or food. If you have a cat or dog, they may continue to stay in your home, but you cannot clean litter boxes or pick up any dog feces. If you have birds, however, they will not be able to stay in your home, as their droppings could cause a lung infection. Please consult with your coordinator if you have any other pets or exotic animals to see if they could also create any health issues for you. Avoid any lifting and all strenuous physical labor until your physician tells you it's okay to increase your level of activity. Do not garden, dig in the dirt, or mow the lawn until you've received permission to do so by your physician. If home remodeling involves the removal of walls or ceilings, leave the area and return only after the resulting dust is completely cleaned up. When away from your home, you and your caregiver should always carry hand sanitizer. It's important that you avoid shaking hands, crowds, and people who are sick, especially those with fevers, colds, or flu symptoms. Do not swim in public pools or lakes. These can be a major source of infection. If you want to swim in a private pool, make sure that it's been properly maintained and chemical levels are checked before use. Also, keep in mind that prednisone and some of the other medications can make you more sensitive to sunlight and skin cancer. Always wear a sunscreen of SPF 25 or higher and avoid lengthy exposure to the sun. Your coordinator will review all of this information with you and your caregiver before you leave the hospital. This is to make sure you fully understand the importance of your home care responsibilities and the significance of maintaining your post-transplant health. Before you are discharged from the hospital, you'll receive a schedule for mandatory clinic appointments. You'll also receive a list of your medications, their dosages, and your lung transplant coordinator's phone numbers. Because emergencies can happen anytime, it's critical that you carry this information with you at all times.
Immediately after discharge, our patients are usually seen weekly for four to six weeks. When you go to the clinic, plan to arrive early as there might be various medical tests required before you can see your transplant doctor. As you progress, visits are usually reduced based on your medical condition. It's important that you understand all clinic appointments are mandatory and they're made to protect your health. Changes that might seem unimportant to you may be critical to the physician. You must attend the clinic as scheduled. Be sure to eat breakfast and take your insulin if you're diabetic, unless your coordinator advises you otherwise. The standard time to check blood level of immune suppressant drugs is 8 a.m. Always bring your medications and medication log with you to the clinic. After your blood is drawn, you will need to take your medication. Sometimes you may receive a call from your coordinator telling you to come to the hospital the next morning for a lung biopsy, chest x-ray, or a CAT scan of the chest if indicated. This is done to monitor your progress. When you are called, you have to make arrangements to come in. Coordinators and physicians review these tests and may request additional tests based on the results. Change in lab values may indicate a potential problem, such as a possible rejection status or improper medication level that has to be addressed as soon as possible to avoid serious complications. Every transplant patient is required to have a primary care physician. However, you will also be followed in the transplant clinic for the rest of your life. I'm here in one of Henry Ford Hospital's guest apartments. These are right on the hospital campus and may be available to you and your family. Your transplant coordinator can offer direction on how to reserve one of these apartments for family during your inpatient stay or for yourself if you're traveling to Henry Ford for extended outpatient testing or treatment. Occasionally, your body will reject your new lung, even if you've carefully followed instructions and taken your medicines faithfully. This is not your fault. At times, the body's immune system successfully attacks the transplanted lung despite your best efforts. Fortunately, this doesn't mean that you'll lose your new lung. The rejection episode can usually be stopped before any major damage occurs. However, this may result in a return to the hospital for additional treatment or an extended hospital stay. A slight drop in lung function tests may indicate early rejection. Other times, it's diagnosed with a lung biopsy done during what's called a bronchoscopy. Warning signs of rejections that you might experience are similar to signs of infection. They are fever over 100 degrees, chills, aches, feeling tired, nausea or vomiting, flu-like symptoms, sore throat, or shortness of breath. If you experience any of these warning signs, tell your coordinator immediately. You may have heard the Henry Ford Health System tagline, all for you. It's not just a slogan. It's the way we engage with every transplant patient. The success of your transplant is our number one goal. The things that make you unique inform every recommendation, every decision, every aspect of your care. We realize that we've covered a lot of information. Please know that you've partnered with one of the best transplant teams in the country. The Henry Ford Transplant Institute is one of only three multi-organ transplantation centers in Michigan. We have performed more than 400 lung transplantation procedures, including Detroit's very first lung transplant in 1994. As reported by UNOS, our innovative procedures and experienced lung transplant teams surpass the national average with our one-year patient and graft survival rates. By continually extending the lives of people with lung disease, we are able to provide our patients with a more meaningful way of life. For additional information on transplants and organ donation, please visit these websites. Thank you for watching and for considering the Henry Ford Transplant Institute for your care.